Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 192 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of MichaelBoyleStrengthCoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck. Also, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Rennan, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. All right, on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about his article, Testing for Hockey. We went deep into some of the off-ice tests like vertical jump, 10-yard dash, 300-yard shuttle, and more. Also spoke to him about a forum thread called Bent Over Resting Posture. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Emmerger from Perform Better joins us to talk about the huge summer sale as well. That actually ends soon. And some of the upcoming education at Perform Better Functional Training Institute. For the results, Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Rachel Cosgrove is on to talk about the guarantee, taking away risk. We continue Alistair McCaw's special segment. Alistair is from the McCaw Method, and he wrote a book called The Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach. In part four today, he talks about your energy as a coach. For the functional movement system segment, Diane Vives is on to talk about using the FMS as your secret weapon for modifying your circuit training. Part one is on where to start. For the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment, I have on Robert Yang. Robert is not only a strength coach, but he's a performance nutrition coach. And he talks about performance nutrition and timing, clean eating, calories in versus calories out, supplementation, hydration, inflammation, and so much more. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how you doing? I am doing Great, Anthony. How are you? I'm back to great. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Coach, we talked about testing for ice hockey when you first – actually, when you did it as like um, – I think it was a blo- it was a forum thread, and you put all this thing in there. It's like, oh, man, we got to get you to do an article on that, and you did. So we did talk about your goal to blue line sprint, your on-ice lateral movement, and your uh, the blue line to goal line shuttle. So I won't go over that right now because, again, it's in the article that you wrote, Testing for Ice Hockey. We have it on the site. Um, and, but, like, let's talk a little bit about – the um, I'm just going to name them, and then you tell us what you want to see uh, and maybe some norms uh, for, for you that you're going to want to see with your hockey players. Um, vertical jump, what are you looking for? Hey, vertical jump probably for, uh, for our males, our collegiate male, you're probably looking at somebody to be 25 and up. I think you're probably your most explosive guys are, are in the mid-30s it was interesting to you. Somebody responded to the article or it actually was the split squad article and said, do you see, you know, with all this unilateral training, many guys in the forties. And I'm like, we don't see many guys in the forties period. I think forties tends to be um, track and field and American football is where you may see a few of those guys. So I would say 25 is probably average 30 is good. And then you get into these guys that are 30 plus 33, 32, 33, 34 are, are in that outstanding category. With the women, I would say probably the average tends to drop down around 21. We do have one one of our females is at just jumped 30 the other day, which is really unusual. We do have some in the high 20s, but we're talking about Olympic team females. So, And the cool thing is our numbers, I looked at our numbers relative to like Luge and Bobsled up at Lake Placid, and we stack up pretty good at least on the female side, so. Yeah, nice. Um, Jack Blatherwick has been preaching this test, the 10-yard dash, for a long time. Talk to us about um, administering this and uh, some things you'd like to see uh, in the 10-yard dash. Well, I love the 10-yard dash because I think it really is a pure acceleration test. It's that kind of zero to 60 that you're looking for. And I've always said, I think probably in all these articles that I've written, one of the things that I've said is we really don't test speed. Even out to 40 yards, 
we're not really testing speed. Technically, we're testing acceleration because if you look and the, the most studied race is the, the Ben Johnson, Carl Lewis race. But in that Ben Johnson, Carl Lewis race, they were accelerating up to 60 meters. So it's a test of acceleration. I think it's extremely predictive in terms of correlating to on ice speed. And it's really predictive in just about any sport. If you get someone who's fast in that 10 yard area, they're fast period. End of story. But what you are really seeing is that they can accelerate, that they have that ability to get from zero to 60, which is, I think in team sport, that's your gold standard. That's really what you want to know. There are very few positions in team sport where even 40 yards or 40 meters matters, but that 10 yard, sprint that ability to go from a dead stop and get up to top speed or something close to it quickly is really important so again for us i think here we have a real problem because we've done electronic we've done handheld and we've done handheld start and electronic finish when we're handheld really fast is 1.5 in the you know in the 1.5 range that's probably again american football really explosive defensive back receiver type guy Generally speaking, I think with our females, if they can run under two, they're again, they're pretty fast. So I think one of the things, and I should have said it probably in the beginning with vertical jump, is you really have to look at who you're testing and say to myself, what is my population? What's my range? Because again, I'm giving you a range for, let's just say, elite division one guys at Boston University or a women's Olympic team members. I know yeah. my norms for my groups. But I think you've got to be careful that you don't get too worked up about what my norm from my group is relative to whatever you might be looking at for your group when, you know, some of like, well, I have high school girl soccer players. Well, they're not going to be anything close to what my girls are doing. Yeah. So you get high school girls, if you get vertical jumps in the 20s, if you can get a 20, 21, 22, you've got a pretty explosive female. And you'll see lots of, I just tested my daughter's team, and I think the low was in the 16s. And the high might have been in the 24s. So when you start looking at, again, a high-end high school girl is a very different range than an Olympic-level female, which, you know, same thing, high school hockey. You know, if we get a high school kid that's in that 25 to 30 range, they're, they're pretty good. Yeah, nice. Well, with the uh, conditioning testing, you said it should be interval in nature and should test performance. And you like to use the 300-yard shuttle run. Talk to us about that. Well, I've always loved the 300-yard shuttle run. I think it's a fairly easy test to administer. You can test a, as many people pretty much as you have coaches and have stopwatches at one time, which, again, falls into that sort of easy to administer. It's interval in nature. It's roughly a minute on. And the way the test was designed, it's a minute on, five minutes off, and then another minute on. So you can look at things. You can look at average time. You can look at the difference between the trials. There's a lot of things that you can look at, all of which are going to be valuable. And I think some people are down on the 300 shuttle now because some coaches, again, have overdone it. And it's coaches, oh, we do three, we do five. And it's the very typical kind of American of, oh, well, you know, if somebody's doing this, uh, I'll do one more or two more. I'll cut the rest down. You know, we do them with a minute rest. What I try to explain to everybody is the reason you have norms is so that everybody can compare. And the 300-yard shuttle, when the test was initially designed, was done with five-minute rest. So we've always stayed with that five-minute rest. And people can argue, well, that's not sport-specific or zip. And I'm like, you're right. But the way the test was done was with five minutes rest. So if I want to compare data with anybody else, I'm going to do it the exact same way. So we've tried to stay true to that thought process so that we could have the conversation that we're having now and say, hey, if a guy averages 56, he's in pretty good shape. If a girl averages under 60, she's in pretty good shape. That's not going to be the same if you do five 300s. It's not going to be the same if you do three with two minutes in between. You know, any way you start to manipulate the variables, then obviously you change the data and you change the distribution of the data and you make it much more difficult to get the kind of comparisons that you want. Um. All right, Coach, great. Um, now, let's go with upper body pushing. You were talking about many coaches prefer push-ups for upper body strength, but the push-ups actually test upper body endurance. You like to do uh, some version of the bench press. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I think 
if you get people that are strong, I think even, you know, it goes back to like the NFL combine thing, the 225 bench press test at the NFL combine has ceased to be a strength test. When you get guys doing 20, 30, 40 repetitions, it's just very specific endurance. Do that. I think what we've tried to do is just get in that like five to eight RM kind of category. And generally for us, we will have them work to failure in terms of, Give me a weight you think you can do five times and then do it as many times as you can do it. The good thing about that, and particularly as we've started to flesh these tests out, say, with our um, women's national team girls, is that somebody only underestimates once. So someone might say, oh, I think I can do 105 for five, and they do 105 for 15. The next time we test them, we're going to bump them up to 115 or 120 or 125 and know that we're in the right category. So it's sort of in that repetition max kind of testing you may miss once but you shouldn't miss more than once and what we have tended to do and i have to we're going to even modify that generally if someone got 10 we made them go up and wait and so if someone could do 135 for 10 then the next time we tested they had to do 140 as opposed to 135 and we've been able to really kind of chug along it's very interesting because we've been doing this now for seven years with our women's Olympic program. And I would say at this point, the majority of our females will bench 135 for more than five reps, really just based on this extremely simplistic testing procedure of do as many reps as you can do. If you can do 10, you got to go up and it, it works. I think the good thing about progressive resistance exercise is that it works. It's simple. It works. And I think we make it more, way more complicated than it is. All right. Uh, upper body pulling. Same idea in terms of repetition max test. We started out with the idea that we would just got to test chin up. And then in the same vein, I didn't want an endurance test. So when someone got to 10, what I, a lot of times when we're training, we're asking them to do sets of three with weight or sets of five with weight. But if they come back to testing and the testing is body weight endurance, get as many reps as you can get. Why would they do what we wanted them to do in training? And that's one of the things I said in the beginning of the article, you want your testing to reinforce your training. So in our situation, we said the same thing. If you do 10 chin-ups, we made a big jump. We said the next time you test, you're going to 25. And we had some girls go from 20, 10 for you know, body weight, 10 to 25 for two or three. But amazingly enough, girls started to get 25 for 10 and then girls got 35 for 10. And we're, we're approaching someone doing 45 for 10 in our Olympic program. Alex Carpenter has done 45 for seven. So she might at some point be testing at 55 pounds. And again, simply based on this super simplistic idea of progressive resistance exercise. I remember years ago reading Dan John wrote an article about his high school strength program called the Southwood program. It's actually on the strengthcoach.com site. If someone goes and searches Southwood and clicks search titles or headlines or whatever it is, it'll come up. But he said his high school program, what they did is they had cement filled bars. And let's just say they had a 50 of, you know, 60, 70, and 80, whatever it was. And basically you got a line behind the bar that you could use. And you had to do basically what amounted to a, a bar complex. Okay, I'm going to press it over my head 10 times, and I'm going to whatever, front squat it 10 times, I'm going to row it 10 times, whatever it was. And the idea was when you could do all that with a 50-pound bar, you got in a 60-pound line. And he said, we had a lot of guys get really strong with this ridiculously simple progressive resistance program with almost no equipment. And you start thinking, this is why I'm always emphasizing to people how easy it is to have a strength program, how easy it is to get somebody stronger. We've, I've written a bunch of stuff about one dumbbell workouts and one dumbbell complexes. And it's just a matter of when you can do it with a weight, go up. When you can do it with that weight, go up. And if you do that, you really can make great progress. All right, good stuff. Uh, Coach, let's move on to lower body. you got the rear foot elevated split squats and the one-legged squats. Talk to us about, you know, the differences and, and why you would do both. Well, what happened to us is that with the rear foot elevated split squat, <laughs> the girls got so good that it was getting hard to do. So we had girls that were at 36 kilos in each hand, and it was really becoming a two-legged test. 
because again, the idea was, okay, grab a set of kettlebells, do as many split squats as you can do. When you ask him to do that, it's really hard to say, okay, how much are you using your back leg? So when we got to that point suddenly where most of the girls in the team could grab the 36s and get 10 reps of each leg, now 36s, you're talking about 80s. I said, we need to do something different. And that was when we switched to one leg squat. And the last time we tested out in Colorado, we tested one leg squat with 60 pounds of external load. So we did basically 40 pound vests with um, 10 pound dumbbells in each hand. And again, most of our girls did 60 for 10. So obviously, logically, what are we doing next time? We're going to 70 and we're going to test them at 70. And we're just going to keep utilizing this idea of progressive resistance exercise and testing them with a progressive resistance emphasis and we keep getting better. All right. Nice. I'll remind everybody the articles on shrinkwitch.com testing for hockey. There's some videos there as well. Um, if you have any questions, you could post those on the forum. Good stuff, coach. Let's talk about one more thing. I thought it was kind of funny um, that it got so much play or not argument, but just like people were surprised uh, the bent over resting posture because the um, the guy R Steele had talked about or had asked that he had said you know bending over when you're tired is a natural resting posture that's what he had heard we've heard that from Anna a- Anna Hartman and and uh, a few others and anyone but also that you know people were talking about like a lot of coaches are always like don't bend over don't let the other team see your weakness so talk to us about this thread it was kind of a surprise that it got so many hits. In truth, I wasn't surprised because I I think there are so many people who are in that kind of old school mentality of no hands on knees, don't bend over. And I was that way too. And then all of a sudden, again, I had the slide in my talk, enter PRI. (laughs) Like suddenly the PRI people, Michael Mullen in particular, start talking about this stuff to us. And you realize there's a reason that you do that. I remember having this conversation with Kayla Harrison that just won the gold medal in judo and saying that to her. I was like, no, do that. I don't care if your opponent thinks you're going to go kick your opponent's ass because you're going to recover better. Don't worry about putting yourself in a poor recovery posture to look more recovered. Worry about being more recovered. And that's, I guess, when people say, how do you explain it to your coaches? That's how I explained it. I said, there's, you know, we can look more recovered by, standing up and yelling at the guys, or we can be more recovered by letting them bend over and get in the right position and getting oxygenated the way that we need to. I'd much rather do the right thing and have somebody look at me and think, Oh, he's weak. He's not ready. And then get up and run that guy over. Then the opposite of stand up there and have him think, Oh yeah. Oh, they're not tired. And then have put somebody back on the field. that's tired or back on the ice. that's tired. So, I think that's the part we have to get through our heads is it's not about, it goes back to the idea. It's not about looking good. It's about playing well. And people are worried about how it looks. Well, how's that going to look? Who cares how it looks? Yeah. And I wrote that in the thread because people were saying that someone had made reference. And it might've been, and I hate the fact that we don't, I accept and put a post up about getting guys to sign their names because I hate referring to him as R. Steele because I don't really know, you know, is he Ron? Is he Ray? Whatever it is, I forget. And I probably should know, but if we looked at what our steel said, I said guys like coach K or Saban, they'd probably be the first ones. If their strength coach came to them and said, no, no, this is what the science is telling us. This is what we need to do. They'd be like me. Okay, guys, hands on knees. Let's go. Let's breathe <laughs> in through your nose, up through your mouth. <laughs> You're right. Cause they knew it was better. And it was going to help them win. And it's the stupid guy who gets stuck in that box of, Oh yeah, you're going to look like you're going to look weak. Like I said, I never worried about looking weak. Yeah, it is. It is kind of funny that we think like that. You know, what would you rather? Would you rather look like you're uh, you're not tired, or would you rather be have more energy? Well, Who cares that you got it? Well, it goes back to my my seminar thing. You know, you can you can ask a question and people think you're stupid, but then you get an answer and you're smart. Or you could just sit there like an idiot and not ask a question. You know, I don't want to look stupid. I'm just going to sit here. I know I'm stupid and then I'm going to remain that way in order to not let anybody know. Yeah. It's, it's the same kind of logic. So, and I think that's what people have to realize is that 
it's much better to ask the question. Who cares? The guy behind you might be like, oh, what an idiot. I can't believe you asked that question. But you go to 100 seminars and you keep asking questions. That guy behind you probably isn't there at all of them. And eventually you're smarter than him. And then he's asking you questions. Good point. Good point. All right, Coach. Well, we're going to let you go on that note. So uh, thanks for coming on, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Ian. I appreciate it. All right, now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better. And we're here with the lovely and talented Erin McGarr. Erin, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. All right, well, we're, gonna, we're not going to probably talk much about equipment today. We're talking, well, a little bit with the sale, but we're going to go education in the Perform Better Functional Training Institute. But let's start with the sale. What do you got? The sale is still going on. Um, I know people are probably sick of me saying it, but it is the best sale we have all year. Our manufacturers actually lower... Our costs, so we're able to pass along the savings to you guys. Um, but all of our top products that we usually have are on sale, and it's not just the small stuff like the bands and medicine balls and things like that that we normally have on sale, but it's some of the bigger items like our half rack, urethane plates and dumbbells, bumper plates, um, assault bikes, things like that. So a lot of big savings. Now's the time to do it. I know the sale is going to be wrapping up. Um, in a couple of weeks, which is scary because I remember saying it was the end of summer sale and I'm like, ah, it's still summer. And now I'm like, oh my God, it's the middle of September. So time is going way too fast, but definitely take advantage of the sale while you can and while it's still going on. Absolutely. Got to get it in there. Um, e, we don't talk much about the Functional Training Institute, Perform Better Functional Training Institute during, you know, kind of the spring and summer because there's so much going on with the one days and the summits, but kind of Right now, there's a little bit of gap with those, so you guys kind of stock up on the uh, uh, on some of the education you do right there at, at your facility. Tell us all about what's happening this fall into the winter uh, at the uh, at the Functional Training Institute. Well, right now, like you said, during the during the year, it's hard with the one days and especially with the summits in the summer to kind of keep these seminars rolling at our location. But now that um, we're kind of Breaking off from those, the Perform Better Functional Training Institute is kicking up again. Uh, we do have some great seminars coming up, and I'm excited that we're going to be bringing them back here. But uh, the first one we have coming up is a Barefoot Training Specialist certification. So it's we're actually hosting Level 1 and Level 2 with Dr. Emily Splickle. I know she's spoken for us a couple times at the summit. Amazing job. Um, but she's going to be hosting the Level 1 certification on Saturday, September 17th. And that's just going to go over some uh, basic foot and ankle anatomy and biomechanics. She's going to go through the foot function and fascial lines um, and then barefoot before, you know, wearing shoes program or her protocols. And then she's also going to be hosting a level two, which is on Sunday, September 18th. And that's going to go through advanced foot biomechanics. She covers um, walking gait cycle, walking, running, uh, different assessments and techniques, things like that. So she did host something here uh, last year, and it was a great turnout. And now that she's hosting level one and level two, um, again, we have some some great numbers for this one. I'm really excited that she's coming back. Um, and then the next one after her is going to be Jason Glass, which Jason is hysterical. I don't know if you've ever heard him talk or had him on, but he just kills me, and I know that um, he's very – comical, which helps the learning process, but he's going to be doing a load and explode workshop on Saturday, October 8th. Um, and that's going to be a one day here and he's going to cover everything from rotational power, uh, slingshot power, rotational slings, scapular stability, covering the pelvis, um, really all aspects of training. But again, he focuses on a lot of rotational movements. He works with a lot of golfers and hockey players and things like that. So um, again, that's October 8th. It's going to be his first time hosting a workshop here. So, again, I'm excited that he's going to be coming out. And then um, those are the first two that are kind of coming our way. We do have Charlie Weingroff coming in doing a three-day November, and then Greg Cook coming in doing his new functional capacity screen in December. Um, but those guys, we can pretty much cover that later because I don't want time to go that fast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And with Charlie, too, uh I will tell everyone, get on uh, the website because that will sell out because people are waiting for that one. And he's filming, I think, too. So, um, Correct. Yeah, that's going to be a big one. So, cool. Lots of good stuff coming up 
from the Perform Better Functional Training Institute. You'll get a chance to uh, maybe even see Aaron McGurr. So, Aaron, <laughs> thanks That's so right. much. <laughs> thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the Functional Movement System segment. My name is Diane Vivas. Today I'd like to start a two-part series about using the FMS as your secret weapon for modifying your circuit program. And for part one, we're going to start by using a key movement principle to help us focus where to start that first session on Monday morning. Now, if you're like me, I've been very fortunate to train a variety of clients and athletes who all have different needs and different goals. But the functional movement screen allows me to take a very simple yet effective approach no matter who that person is and allows me to make some really smart adjustments in their program design. Now a great way to practice this thought process and especially if you're looking at designing these circuits the first thing you may want to do is say okay what would an ideal circuit look like for somebody who has these goals or particular uh, uh, training needs and then design the circuit as if there's all green lights and no limitations. What does that ideal circuit look like? And then introduce the screen score sheet. And it usually reveals a, a limitation, a weak link pattern that needs to be your priority. It may uh, be the first priority in the algorithm that has a, a one or an asymmetry. We look at the movement principle number two, and then that tells us first to protect. The movement principle says protect, correct, and then develop. So that's gonna trigger me to say, what do we need to protect them from? What's, what are things that we might need to remove from this person's uh, individual training program, activities, things that might be loading on top of this uh, dysfunctional or limited pattern. And it also might be working against us as we're trying to apply these corrective strategies. So we want to make sure and have a positive conversation with the client. Always come from a positive coaching aspect and we talk to them about this opportunity. The things that we may need to just uh, temporarily suspend or, or remove, and then the things that we're going to be adding to actually explore further what might help them to get to their goals much faster. And so one place that we're going to start in terms of programming is look at creating a pre-session routine. This is something they can do on their own. Uh, they don't need us there for. And we can start exploring that within this first session. It's possibly going to look like breathing, soft tissue work, uh, some stretches, some basic mobility, things that they can immediately benefit from and also sets us in a really good position to start their movement prep during that next session. For example, if it's active straight leg raise, uh, somebody might, um, if needed, work on breathing and then have a lower body focus of soft tissue work um, based on tools that they feel comfortable using then we may apply some assisted straight leg raise stretch or a, a half kneeling hip flexor stretch and then basic mobility drills such as a core activation leg raise. We can introduce these that first session and then quickly recheck the active straight leg raise to see if they're making a positive change and that we're going in the right direction and that we know we have the right movements or the right drills and strategies for that pre-session work. Once we've established that then we can focus on the movement prep now this is something that we're always going to be there to guide them through. We want to make sure and make the, the best mobi mobility gains that we can and then be able to apply some static motor control feeding into that new range of motion with an exercise or a drill. Challenging them enough but also allowing them to be successful. And then we're also going to add other movements in other green light patterns just to always create a nice well-rounded movement prep or warm-up and also increase the activity level that really gets them ready for the circuit training that we're getting ready to do. Now, that takes you down those first steps of that thought process, and that's how we would get started. Just so that you guys know, we actually have created a new two-day level course, and if you're not familiar with that, check it out. If you've done a level two already in the past, I'm just going to give you guys a, a really good tip here, is you can actually register for like $99 to reattend or audit the course, you're going to get to see the new content. We've created uh, some great case study scenarios that really help build confidence in this thought process. Uh, review correctives, you can receive two days worth of CEUs all for that like $99 price. So I just want to make sure you guys know about that. 
So uh, thank you guys for listening to, to part one of this segment. Look forward to introducing you to part two where we're really going to tackle the actual circuits and how to modify. Hi everyone, it's Rachel Cosgrove on the Business of Fitness segment with Results Fitness University. And last time we talked about a checklist for marketing. If you didn't hear that podcast, uh, check that one out. And I'm going to just go a little further, a little deeper into one of the topics on that checklist that you're going to include on your marketing. And that topic is the, the guarantee, the take, the taking away risk. So anytime you are putting out a marketing piece, anytime you are trying to get people to sign up with you, something we as fitness professionals want to think about is what we sell is we can't hand it to our customer. We can't hand it to our clients. It's, it's not like, uh, like a company like Zappos, uh, who I've worked closely with and I've gone out and, and gone to their mentorship and I've spoke for, uh, for their mentorship. And you know, when I'm talking to them and speaking to them for them, they, they sell shoes. So when they take someone's credit card or they take someone's money or someone, you know, is, um, becomes a customer for them, they get to hand that person their brand new shiny shoes and that person gets to wear those shoes. And especially with Zappos, they actually get them to them overnight. So, you know, basically the next day that person's going to have their shoes um, and it, be able to wear them and already have that gratification. So they don't have that buyer's regret. You know, maybe they, they spent more on those shoes than they meant to, but guess what? They get to rock those shoes the next day. And so, you know, they've already got that, you know, that, that gratification that they've um, that they've spent the money, but they, they got what they wanted. For us, it's a little different because when we sign people up for fitness, when we start to get them going on our services, we can't hand them their new body. We can't say, you know, here you go, here's your new body and, you know, transaction over. Instead, it's a process. It's a journey, as we all know. And so when someone signs up with us, you know, initially, they may, you know, they may not feel that same gratification. So we want to, we want to give them that, you know, that, take away that risk because if they, if we take away that risk, um, now they're going to be more likely to sign up with us. They're going to be more likely to change their mind. They're going to they're, change their life. Um, and they're going to, you know, really commit to us because they know, Hey, you know what? There's no risk. I may as well. So when you are putting out, um, you know, the, the marketing pieces to attract those people, then what I want you to think about doing is putting in this bold guarantee. And I know it's scary to guarantee, um, you know, if you could say, you know, a 30 day money back guarantee, if you don't get results in the first 30 days, I will give you your money back. And here's a couple things I want you to think about when you're doing that. I know it's scary, but um, number one, we have to take away that risk because what we sell them, we can't hand to them. Uh, number two, uh, Number, you, if you can't guarantee what you do, if you as a fitness professional are unable to guarantee that you can get results, then we really need to look at why not? You know, why don't you feel confident that you could put that guarantee on what you do? So, you know, that's really something that you really want to be at that point where you're confident enough that you could say, listen, if you follow what I'm about to tell you, if you follow the nutrition strategies I'm going to give you, the, the, and you, you show up consistently. And of course you can have an agreement between you and the client that says, listen, you got to do everything I tell you to do in order to get this guarantee. Um, but you know, you definitely want to have that laid out, but you should be confident as a coach that you can get those results and that you can guarantee those results. So including that bold guarantee is so important. Um, the third thing I wanted to mention uh, when we're talking about putting that bold guarantee, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, yes, but I'll put that guarantee on my marketing and then there'll be some jerk who'll come in and they won't do what I tell them to do and they won't get the results and then they'll ask for their money back. And what I'm going to say to that is, yes, you're right. There are, you know, a number of people in the world, unfortunately, that are jerks that will, um, you know, try to take advantage or, um, you know, try to pull one over on you. And, you know, yes, if that, if one of those people comes into your business, um, here's what I want you to think about. Be because you put that bold guarantee out there, because you took that risk away uh, and you really made this risk free for your potential client, you're going to have so many more people that are going to come in. They're going to hire you and they're going to change their life. And, because of that, yes, you might get one or two jerks that do come in, but, but you wouldn't have got the other 10 to 15 great people who you got to work with. So focus on the people that did come in to change their life. If you do get somebody that comes in and asks for their money back, give them their money back. You'd rather that and have them out of your life than continue to work with that person. And, you know, and just realize that because 
you did that and because you know you did put that guarantee out there that you are getting more people overall and so it's worth it to have you know if you do end up having that one or two people that come in and do ask for their money back um, overall you're going to end up with more clients you're going to change more lives and you're going to help more people and so don't focus on the jerks <laughs> focus on the other people who who really value what you have to offer and are ready to change their life um, so there you go. That's you know really why you need to include that guarantee, take away that risk. Um, as fitness professionals, I think we all forget how intimidating and scary it is to sign up at a gym or with a trainer. And so when we take away that risk, we really you know take away that that one obstacle that may be keeping some of our clients from changing their life. So hopefully that gives you some ideas as you put together those marketing and uh, and you guys can change more lives. Again, this is Rachel Cosgrove with the Business of Fitness segment with Results Fitness University. We do have an event coming up on October 13th, 14th, and 15th, our Results Fitness Launchpad. Make sure you check out resultsfitnesslaunchpad.com to get more information on that, and I hope to see you all there. Hi, everyone. Alistair McCoy here, and great to be with you again on today's Strength Coach podcast. I'm a sports performance coach and the author of Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach. So we've already covered chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book, and just in case you might have missed them or need a little reminder, here's a quick summary. In chapter 1, we spoke about the importance of setting your standards as a coach. We looked at your personal standards, your standards for your working environment, and the standards you have for your clients or athletes. In chapter 2, we spoke about building your method or philosophy. And there we discussed the advantages of having a documented method and how important it was to understand your whys and not just your hows. In chapter three, we spoke about the ability to adapt as a coach. We touched on how important it was to understand and connect with the generation you're working with. We also discovered that great coaches are great solution finders and they can adapt and adjust quickly. So in today's episode, we're gonna look at chapter four and that's all about your energy as a coach. What I've discovered in most great coaches is that they have a great aura and energy about them. In fact, it's not just found in great coaches, but people who are able to inspire and influence people for the better. To be a great motivator of others, you need to have a great energy about you. It's funny, but I always like to compare a great coach to that of a, a radio DJ in the morning. So let me ask you this. If you were driving in your car on the way to work in the morning and you switched on the radio, Would you want to listen to somebody that sounded low in energy, maybe in a bad mood, or simply quite bored? No, of course you wouldn't. You have a choice, so you'll probably switch over to the next channel or station, right? Well, the same applies for your clients. They have a choice. One of the worst things a coach or trainer can do is also bring their problems to work. Another one is being moody. No one wants to be around these kind of people. You see, just like that radio DJ, no matter what he or she might be going through in their personal life, you still need to bring a great energy and a service to your clients or athletes. As coaches and trainers, a big part of our job is to keep our clients motivated, inspired, uplifted, and ready to take on the day. Here's another thing, and this is something I really especially try to get through to the younger coaches and trainers starting in our industry. Your work ethic and attitude will get you a lot further than your certificates and coaching badges. Don't get me wrong. It's important to keep yourself updated and knowledgeable, and it's important to attend seminars and courses. But I can promise you that your attitude to life and how you interact with others will attract a lot more business than the abbreviated letters after your name. Like Coach Boyle says, and I love this, the most important certification of all is a CNP. What is a CNP, you ask? a certified nice person. You see, to be a success in this business, you don't need to know it all. You just need to pitch up to work on time and bring your best self. Also in this chapter of the seven keys to being a great coach, I discuss the importance of your personal energy. I believe that in life, your energy is everything. Energy is powerful enough to create your own success or contribute to your decline. Everything you're involved in is a result of the energy you contribute. Never forget that we attract what we become and what we hold in our minds both consciously and subconsciously. Our athletes and clients deserve the best from us. We're in the fitness industry, so we should be walking the talk. Like I mentioned in Chapter 1, the most important example is always ourselves. Because your clients might have a buy-in from the start, but it will be the believe-in that determines if they stay or not. On closing, my question to you is this. Are you getting through your day 
or are you getting after your day? Because there's a big difference. Coaches, that's all from me for today. To connect with me, get over to my Twitter at Alistair McCaw. You can also find my book, The Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach, on Amazon.com. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I look forward to bringing you the next chapter, and that will be Chapter 5, Improving Your Interpersonal Skills. Until then, I'm Alistair McCall, wishing you greatness today. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach. And today I have on an old friend, Robert Yang. And Robert is a performance nutrition coach. My first uh, contact with him is uh, was through TPI, Titus Performance Institute. Robert's on the advisory board there. And, um, you know, saw a few lectures from him and uh, has taught some of the courses. Not only uh, nutrition, though, teaches the Olympic lifting course. So he works in both worlds, uh, not only the nutrition Peach, but the coaching Pete, the strength coach Pete. Robert, thanks for coming on today. Hey, thanks, Anthony, for having me on. All right, well, you know, um, God, you know, nutrition, I was telling you earlier, we could probably have you on uh, every six months because, uh, you know, the <laughs> answers right. might change a little bit. And that's, you know, the science changes and different research comes out. And uh, But, um, you know, we're going to do some general stuff for the most part because I want to get your take on on, on, on a lot of different uh, areas, and that might include performance nutrition and uh, supplementation, clean eating, hydration, calories in, calories out, which always uh, starts wars on the Internet. Um, but uh, yeah. let's, you know, this is the Strength Coach Podcast, so let's start out with the um, this performance nutrition idea and really I guess let's let's go with timing wise because you know for my strength coaches out there um, and even my personal trainers you know we're going to look at two things whether it's game day or it's workout day can you just give us some uh, let's let's start pre-workout or pre-game and they, they're probably going to be both uh, but they're, they're going to be different uh, answers but give us your thoughts on timing pre-game, pre, pre-workout, and uh, what you like to see uh, maybe from a macronutrient content uh, uh, breakdown and maybe some examples of that. Sure. Uh, I think the biggest thing we have to always take into account is the individual athlete before the event and obviously what the event is. Uh, in general, with most, you know, 90% of the sports that are out there, they are, you know, going to be anywhere from, you know, like, let's say football, you know, we're looking at four quarters, 15 minutes. So, you know, two hours or so. Um, so you have to look at the timing, the duration, and you have to look at the sport as well. So in terms of if we're talking about macronutrients, uh, really what I want to always try to create before an event is level blood sugar. And so it's, you know, we talk about, oh, you know, that's my BFF, my best friend forever. Well, your best friend forever for blood sugar control is your PFF, what I refer to. So protein, fat, and fiber. So I know a lot of people are caught up in carbs, 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 and you need carbs for energy, and that's true. Um, but what I find over the years is that as long as you can get the blood sugar nice and stable, that keeps the person even keel and sustains their blood sugar throughout an event or you know um, an athletic event. So uh, definitely protein has to be in there. Um, some fat, um, and then fiber, I would say it's got to come from vegetable or fruit. And that way you can keep the blood sugar fairly stable. Um, now that you have to experiment with a little bit because some people do better with more protein and and other people do better with a little more fat. So, um, I mean, if you were to look at it, you can probably start somebody at, you know, 30% protein or 33, 33, 33, basically isocaloric, uh, a portion of macros, uh, before an event. And then from that standpoint, if a person says, oh, man, I just feel like the food's kind of sitting in me a little bit longer than I like, then what you would do is you'd probably drop the fat first because fat can be so satiating with, um, with most people. Nice. And the, and the timing wise, we're going to have to play with that a little bit too. Is that maybe like, cause I, obviously if, uh, from a digestion perspective or if they're feeling, you know, maybe a little, uh, a, you know, not only say bloated, but you know, they feel a little, a little uh, weighted down. Right. I, I, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, I always give an example of timing of, you know, when they're having their meal before an event. And, you know, in college I used to train with my roommate and, um, I came down, you know, an afternoon and he's eating like a five course meal. And I'm like, uh, dude, we got to go train legs in about 
20 minutes. He goes, no, 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 it's okay. I'm like, no, we're going to train legs. We're doing, you know, basically barf puking squat uh, a session. And uh, he's just eating away. And um, yeah, he goes to the gym, has no problem. I'm about to puke my guts out. And he has no problems. Um, whereas I need probably an hour and a half uh, a digestion time before um, I train. So, you know, it, it's going to vary from person to person. So obviously you don't want to do this on, you know, a big game day. You have to play around with yeah. this, um, you know, and uh, experiment with each individual person. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what about supplementation for, uh, you know, kind of pregame? Um, obviously within the limits of whatever rules there are. But like, like right. from a, a natural, like, is there some supplementation that might help pre, pre-workout, pregame? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, one of the biggest ones that I've used for years um, are branched amino acids as well as free-form amino acids. Um, the, bi- the, the reason why I recommend um, branched amino acids and free-form versus, let's say, someone taking a whey shake is that um, they are sources of protein, but the source of protein is at a different state of, um, I guess you could say, digestion. So you could think of as you know whey protein as... Um, a, a long chain of uh, cars in a, in, on a train. So they're all hooked together, linked together. Well, BCAAs or free from amino acids, they're a bunch of cars, but they're not linked together. So the digestion process is really minimal. Um, there's research showing as in little as 15, 20 minutes, you can get super physiological uh, amounts of amino acids in the blood uh, with just taking straight BCAAs um, as well as free form amino acids. So I like to use BCAAs, um, or free form aminos before an event. And I just have some start sipping it or before they work out, they drive to the gym, takes them 15 minutes. They start sipping it. Um, they warm up for 10 or 15 minutes and boom, they've got super physiological doses in the blood and it can be used for many different purposes. Um, there's research showing it can be used as a pure energy source for skeletal muscle cells. Um, as well as uh, decreasing the catabolic process during a workout. Um, and so I think the biggest effect that I see from a clinical point of view is that a lot of my guys come back and say, Rob, I don't know what you gave me, but um, I'm not sore the next day. And, and this is after implementing a new workout. And you know, with most people, if it's a new movement or the reps or sets are different or you know, there's a lot of lactic acid filled up during the workout. Uh, usually there'll be some kind of residual soreness the next day. And um, I would say, you know, 70 to 80% of my athletes go, come back and say, wow, like, I love this stuff. Give me more. <laughs> nice. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, I guess, you know, again, it's going to have to depend on the event in terms of um, during the event. Because, I mean, if it's golf, we can maybe have some bars or something, you know, not something natural uh, out there because we have that kind of downtime. Uh, maybe for, you know, different sports are going to, it's going to be different for, but without getting into the hydration piece, what are some recommendations for maybe during the event or during the workout? Uh, and what we're talking about, are we talking about golf or are we talking about no, uh, a different a, anything sport? in general? Yeah, it could be golf, but it, you know, in general, like any sport, I know again, sport's going to be different, but, um, yeah. but you know, in the workout, number one, and then uh, the other answer will be like for the different sports. Yeah, I, I would say, um, that that's where I would have, have people, um, mix up a, a big container of branch amino acids and they sip it before, but during their event. So let's say it's a football game or a basketball game that's what they would actually be sipping um, during, during the event. So as they're hydrating and taking breaks, um, they're sipping on branched amino acids because, again, that can be used as an energy source, and you're also preventing that sort of catabolic process. So um, in the big picture, you're actually working on recovery as well as giving energy during the event. Um, and you know, some athletes uh, will require um, carbohydrates. So at that point, then you could add in some carbohydrate powder uh, during, uh, the event. Um, and they can use that during an event, uh, intra workout, intra event. Okay, great. And then for post-workout, you, you might be saying BCA is again, because <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, right, recovery. yeah, yeah. That it, you're, you're talking about the recovery window. So, I mean, I was speaking of the choir because most people know, you know, you have that window of opportunity after you train 
And so, um, you know, you've already got BCAAs into the system. So basically what I tell my athletes is they, they mix a big jug, jug of it and, and then they're sipping it before, during, and then whatever's left towards the end, they just chug that. Um, now, depending on, let's say, body composition. So if I have someone who's a little bit uh, overweight or needs to lose some body fat, then they're just basically going straight to whole food. But if it's, for example, a hard gainer, um, then for sure we're going to go with the whole post-workout uh, recovery drink um, using whey protein and you know carbohydrate. I know a lot of people are touting four to one ratio, four to one ratio. If someone's really on the lanky side and they really need to just gain weight fast, then I might push it up to that. So they might have 100 grams of carbohydrates, so about 25 grams of protein. Um, but if you're someone who needs to lose body fat and need to, you know, I don't know, come down to a different weight class, then I would just use BCAAs and then you go with whole food sources within about an hour of, ch- of finishing a training session. Okay. Or cool. game. Yeah. So yeah. within that hour. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Great. Um, let's move on to clean eating. Um, I'm always confused. I mean, you see, you see this a lot and, um, you know, you do get confused because then there's the whole, you know, is clean eating whole foods is clean eating, eating organic. What, you know, what is it? Yeah. I mean, it, it really depends on the context of the person you're actually working with. You know, I, I work with a variety of people, not just professional athletes or, you know, a general population. I work with a gamut of, of type of people and athletes. So in depending on who you're working with, like if I'm getting kind of a granola type person, like clean eating is just eating organic food all the time, but it could be, you know, organic, some donuts, or it could be, you know, um, organic, um, you know, just food in general. Uh, but I think with most people, when you say, you know, hashtag clean eating, uh, most people are talking probably in the, I guess the bodybuilding sense of clean eating. So pretty much from a whole food perspective, um, eating, you know, proteins and, you know, fats and carbohydrates that are from probably unprocessed, uh, sorts of carbohydrates and veggies. So pretty simple. Um, you know, I, have joked around with my wife, you know, and said, well, what's dirty eating, you know? <laughs> um, and usually, you know, that's going to be people that just junking out on food and, and, yeah. and junk food and sugars and chips and candies and things of that sort. Yeah. Or, um, Kim Basinger in nine and a half weeks with Mickey Rourke. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, that would be dirty eating. Um, well, you know, it's funny because, okay, so um, when we talk about something like clean eating, um, it's almost like, all right, no shit, right? I mean, you know, because aren't we supposed to be doing that? Like to try not to eat as much, uh, you know, as little like processed foods as we can. But again, it's going to go back. I was telling you, I just got um, Dr. Seaman's book, The Deflame Diet. Right. And, you know, the first chapter he does go over some things, you know, for you to eat. And then he talks about things he likes for breakfast. And, you know, but it's funny. It's like, okay, pro-inflammatory, so things that make you in- inflamed, refined sugar, mm-hmm. refined grains, grain flour products, trans fats, refined omega. Okay, so all the rest of it, if you had this diet, technically, I guess, you'd be eating clean. So, you know, it kind of things kind of run into each other, it seems like. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's why there's, you know, some principles to follow. Um, obviously, if you can eat you know, whole foods and their, you know, natural state as much as possible, protein, your carbohydrates and, and, uh, your, your fats and things of that sort, then, you know, you're going to be in a good place. Um, I think where, um, maybe the, the, where there's some, maybe some confusion or whichever is that people, some people get so wrapped up in macros, you know, they get, okay, it has to be 40% protein, it has to be 30% carbs, and it has to be, you know, 29.9% fat. Um, and so as long as it fits that, you know, paradigm, then I'm good. Even if there's sugar and even if there's, you know, um, processed wheat in there or whatever. And, um, you know, from a, from a big picture perspective, and I'm, I'm always talking about big picture long term, uh, because people want to play sports for a long time or, you know, be playing golf three or four times a week. Uh, if they're retired or whatever that is. And so, you know, it does make a difference in the big picture of trying to reduce your sugar consumption, um, try to eat unprocessed foods. Um, even if it doesn't fit in your macros, um, it's going to do, uh, in, in terms of, let's say, gut health, for example, 
um, you know, a lot of the, 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 even if it's in your macros, if it's high in sugar, um, then it'll cause inflammation within your intestinal tract. Whenever you cause excessive inflammation within the intestinal tract, that in turn will affect your recovery because that in turn affects your immune system and your immune system is very much linked with your recovery and your ability to recover. So in that sense, um, and, and also, you know, you just brought up the, the issue of inflammation. Whenever you inflame the intestinal tract, that's going to bring about inflammation uh, within the, the body systemically from a systemic point of view. Because basically whatever you put in your mouth and it goes into your, your small intestine, that's where it can be doing good or bad. And so oftentimes when you eat a lot of the processed foods and sugars, um, then that will lead to um, inflammation, which again uh, turns to affecting the immune system. Okay. Yeah. Can you basically give us a general overview of inflammation too? Because I think a lot of people do get confused with that because sure. it's just one of those words that can mean a few different things. Right. So, I mean, b- the basic two types of inflammation is you've got acute infl- inflammation and then you chronic inflammation. So with acute inflammation, that's something, you know, if somebody gets an injury and, you know, the joint swells up, it gets red, inflamed, um, that's normal. That's a natural process of the body to, to eventually heal that particular joint, let's say. Um, whereas chronic inflammation is inflammation that's been there for some time. Um, and sometimes with inflammation, especially when we're, we're talking about specifically joints in general, um, sometimes it can be due to non-contact or uh, non-injuries. Um, it's due to what someone's eating within their, um, their diet. Um, you know, for example, uh, one lady, every time she eats wheat, her, her joints hurt. Um, and then we take it out, and then she tries it again. Damn it, my joints hurt. I said, well, your body's not lying to you. You got to come off the wheat. Um, and it, it, it's not just gluten. You know, I know gluten's a huge term right now. It's super trendy. I mean, I've looked into gluten for probably over 10 years now. Um, and um, yes, it is a trend, but there's definitely a medical reason why people need to be off of it. Um, and there's also clinical reasons why um, some people may, may need to be off of um, wheat products and gluten products. But um, I mean, even then, I mean, even if you went gluten free, you, you got gluten free donuts and cookies and things like yeah. that. It's still a ton of sugar, right? So yeah. that can lead to inflammation within uh, someone's body. So what we're talking about is more chronic inflammation um, that is a is a problem. Yeah, but our coaches still need to know that because you know it could be it could affect performance. So yeah, absolutely. You know, and it it can affect. You know, obviously, there's a lot, number of factors that affect joints, but um, you know that if 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 someone's doing the right things and they're supposedly eating the right foods and they're still having joint issues and you mow them and you do, you know, dry needling and a- ART and, and they're still not getting better and they're doing all the right things and mm-hmm. you got to start looking towards a diet because there's something systemically creating some kind of inflammatory effect. Yeah. Is there, um, we'll go back to supplementation on this. Um, yeah. Is there a supplementation that, you would recommend as well, just in general, like just say in general, just to kind of keep inflammation down, not to be like, so we can cheat and have those donuts, but yeah, what, yeah, what, right. <laughs> what uh, is, no, I, I, yeah, I think that one thing that I would always recommend, um, for people to do is, you know, first thing in the morning, wake up, drink water and, um, take probiotics because when you take probiotics, you know, the good guys are battling the bad guys constantly. And so, um, you can think of the good guys as sort of a uh, fire extinguisher for the inflammation that can occur. And, you know, I mean, it, it's not just food. Like if someone's really stressed out, right, um, you got an athlete, you know, like I have this high-level pitcher at one of the biggest universities, and this particular athlete is, you know, waking up at 6 or 5.30 for 6 a.m. workouts, then has class from 8 all the way to – 3.30 and then has two hours of practice after, I mean, they've been like kennel at both ends. So they've got stress out the wazoo. And so they eat fairly well, they limit their sugars, but they're getting a uh, sort of inflammatory effect within their digestive system from different avenues. And obviously, I mean, we can, <laughs> that's a whole nother uh, topic for a different show. Yeah. Um, and, and how you, how you got to look at that because, you know, I learned a long time ago from, from Paul check is like, you know, you can't just assume that once the athlete leaves your door that everything's okay. 
you got to start taking account all the lifestyle stuff because you have no idea what kind of stress they're under with all their studies and you know financial problems or whatever they're all going through and so that's going to factor into your program design and how much you know pounding you're giving them into your gym or your studio absolutely um yeah it's obviously a big topic right now with you know with with stress and and the monitoring right. and um and trying to figure all this stuff out it's good that people are certainly more aware of that um Robert, that sounds like, I mean, obviously like a pretty good general recommendation too with the probiotics in the water. I mean, I was looking, I was kind of pumped when you know, I got his diet. I'm a big coffee drinker and I love red wine. So those are, and dark chocolate. So those are like three good things like that people, a lot of times they're pretty controversial in terms of, of, uh, of, of you know, just, you know, you, whether or not you drink too much of, of either one, uh, the coffee and the wine. Um, but can we just go from a general perspective of supplements? Because, like, let's say we're eating relatively clean, right? Do we need supplements? Are there supplements that you say to everybody, like, listen, you should take these supplements. Like, uh, I, like for example, I take a multivitamin, some fish oil, and vitamin D. You know, a vitamin D mostly because I'm in a, my facility is in a basement and I don't have any windows. So um, right. I feel like I need that. So, um, But what's your general recommendations for just – you know, everybody should be getting these supplements. Right. And that's, that's what I, I come up with my, basically my top five, um, in a book I just recently wrote. Um, and basically it's a multivitamin. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's with, as with any topic, you can find pros and cons of thing, especially with nutrition. So, but what I find clinically is that if you can get a multivitamin in, um, that will help a lot because most people don't eat perfectly. Now, is it the best solution? No. I mean, I, I would love for people to eat, you know, organic food 100% of the time, but it just doesn't happen. Um, and uh, when we're talking about the athletic population, uh, we're talking about population that's burning the candle at both ends. Mental and physical perspective, they're really, really uh, putting their body through the ringer. So, um, a multivitamin helps. Um, as you mentioned, vitamin D, that's a massive one. There's more and more research every day um, about vitamin D that's coming out. Um, it's just that the, the, the compounding factor with vitamin D is that, one, people are afraid to go in the sun because they're afraid to get uh, melanoma. Um, I mean, I can talk two hours about this in terms of lecture, but um, you know, there's a specialist here, UCSD, and, and he says that, you know, you need to go in the sun, but you need to go in the sun without burning. The problem is people go in the sun, they want to get tan and they, and they turn into a lobster <laughs> after being in, you know, in, yeah. in, you know, like, you know, in the gym basement for six months or in the office for six months and they go on vacation to Hawaii and they want to get a tan in, in five hours. Yeah. And that's a problem. Um, so, you know, vitamin D is, is important. Um, and I would recommend that, in general, if you, you know, if you work out twice a week, three times a week, um, probably 5,000 IUs, or even if you don't work out, 5,000 IUs is the bare minimum. Now, if you work with an athletic population where, you know, you're working with collegiate athletes to the elite guys, they should be ten, taking 10,000 IUs per day. Um, and people say, oh, well, that's kind of awfully a lot. I go through sometimes 20 to 30 times that, but that's in very specific cases where people are sick. Um, but, uh, think of it this way, uh, there's a, a general thumb, it's 20 minutes, 20,000 IUs. So if you go in the sun and you expose, you know, you just let's take your, you take your shirt off and you go in, you know, at noon and you go, um, sunbathe for 20 minutes, your body has the capacity to produce 20,000 IUs in that 20 minutes. So because it has a natural capacity to do that, 10,000 10, IUs is, is half that. So yeah. there's no toxicity with 10,000 IUs. Um, you know, the third one would be probiotics, like I said, uh, just because we come into so many different things. You know, as we're shifting to fall and then into winter, that's probably the number one supplement. Like if you had to choose anything, I would go with a probiotic. If that's only, you know, financially that's only you can afford, go with that because that's going to help with your immune system. And how much of that do we need? Yeah, with, uh, with the probiotics, I would say it's got to be a minimum of a 20 billion CFUs. So basically CFUs is the colony forming unit. Um, if you take something that has like 5 billion, uh, I mean, you might get a little bit of effect, but you've really got to dose it on the higher end. Um, 
the, if you have any sort of symptoms, like you get maybe loose stools or you get a little bit of gas or bloating, then you might be going towards the upper end. Uh, but I would say 20 billion is, is probably the minimum. Um, and then, uh, the actual, uh, the fourth or the fifth one fish walls, I mean, we don't talk a lot about that. Uh, but as we talked about, things change. Uh, I'll be coming out with an article on fish oils, um, pretty soon about, um, how, you know, you need to t get some, but it depends on someone's diet, depends on their stress level. Um, and usually probably one to three grams is going to be sufficient. Um, if someone's diet's really bad, then you got to go, um, towards probably double that six grams for a period of time. Uh, and then the fifth supplement that most people don't realize is magnesium. Uh, magnesium is involved in over 350 processes in the body. Um, it's heavily involved in terms of, you know, ATP production. So you can think of, you know, you need a spark plug to start your, uh, car. Well, in order to produce energy, you need magnesium to get that ATP going. It's that spark plug for ATP production. Um, you know, just a couple quick signs that people probably are deficient in magnesium. If you have anybody who's cramping all the time, cramping in the calves, or they got little cramps in the stomach or arms or twitching, that's a classic sign that you are magnesium deficient. Um, and then two, uh, the other uh, sign is that they crave chocolate. <laughs> so oh, if you crave chocolate, yeah, if you crave chocolate, and you know, I, what, I, what I tell my, my guys is I go, look, on my left hand, I have a handful of Skittles, and on my right hand, I have a handful of dark chocolate, or chocolate, Wh which one would you choose? Oh man, chocolate, I don't, I don't care for candy, it's gotta be chocolate. That's a telltale sign that you probably are deficient in magnesium. Because if you look at the cacao bean, it has a high source, one of the highest sources of magnesium. And so it's a very, you know, obviously there's sugar in it, but um, the magnesium helps to calm the nervous system down. And so we're living in the world of high stress times. And so most people are just burning through magnesium every single day. Wow. Yeah, my wife definitely has to get back on the probiotic and the magnesium. <laughs> That's right. Because when she tries to, you know, quit her chocolate, I don't know, it doesn't really work. So <laughs> we yeah. got to get her on the magnesium. Um, That's right. Oh, awesome. Great stuff. Um, we'll talk about the book in a little bit. I want to get when, you know, the date, when it's coming out, et cetera. Um, let's go back to um, well, the supplement for recovery. Um, besides the BCAAs, is, was there anything else that, you know, because again, recovery is another one of those things that really everybody's talking about. We know, okay, sleep and nutrition, et cetera. But from the perspective of supplementation, is there anything that you would add in, in there? Yeah. Um, one of the things I would probably add, especially for, um, you know, as we all know, paleo is really popular or ketogenic or, you know, low carb. Um, one of the, um, good sources, uh, of amino acid is glutamine. Um, and I first found out about glutamine way back in, geez, 1994. I was actually doing research in the library and I found a, a research, um, article about glutamine in the use of burn patients. Because if you know anything about burn patients, um, you know, they lose their skin and basically, you know, we, we don't think about it, but your skin is your immune system. <laughs> um, it protects you from um, getting infection. So when these burn patients have <laughs> no skin, no protection, their immune system just is shot. And so they've done um, uh, a lot of extensive research on glutamine um, on burn patients and helping with the immune system. So regardless, there's tons of more information about glutamine, but the way that you can use it is you can use it during um, a, a, an event or during a training session and glutamine is classified what we call a gluconeogenic amino acid, meaning it can be used as an alternative source of glucose. And so um, obviously that's going to be energy source for skeletal muscle uh, cells. Um, but also where I'm looking at it um, from a different perspective is I'm looking at it again for the immune system effects. Because um, especially with all my endurance athletes, you know, we, as we all know, with, with, with overtraining, usually it comes with uh, the volume. People start getting sick because of the volume increases, especially with endurance training. Um, it's not from the intensity. Um, yeah, some guys who train, you know, high loads all the time will get overtrained uh, from a different um, uh, physiological perspective. But 
when we're talking about high volumes of training, that's when the immune system gets beat up. And so that's where if you have anybody who like, oh man, winter's coming, training volume's going to increase, I'm going to get upper respiratory tract infections, I'm going to get sinus infections, you got to get them on glutamine. It's probably one of the best ways to really strengthen the immune system because literally what you're doing is when you're taking glutamine, you are literally feeding the mucosal cells in your intestinal tract. You're not feeding your muscles, but what you're doing is you're feeding the intestinal cells so the immune system can be upregulated so that you can prevent further loss of glutamine within muscle cells. So people that say, oh, you know, it, it doesn't get into muscle cells, it just feeds the, uh, the guts. Yeah, that's true, but we want that to happen so that we don't take away the glutamine source from the muscle cells because muscle cells, um, the primary uh, amino acid in muscle is glutamine. So, um, you know, if you have those, those athletes that are constantly sick all the time, start adding glutamine into the, into the, um, their either their intro workout, um, or during the games and it'll help a tremendous amount. Great stuff. Um, I want to, oh, oh, by the way, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. So with the glutamine, I would use, um, 0.15 to probably, you know, if someone's really kind of teetering and getting sick all the time, 0.35 grams per kilograms of body weight. Um, it's a lot, but you'll notice some pretty decent effects, um, when you use that dosage. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll kind of skirt a couple of issues on this question and that would be one of the biggest arguments there is out there and that's calories in versus calorie out calories out and and i think in general it seems like the answer is always protein right i mean because you know i was reading in uh in the lean muscle diet alan alan aragon and, and lou Schuler wrote that and they were talking about the therm thermic effect of food and they they basically were saying that the thermic effect of food for protein is about 25%. So that means that a quarter of the protein you eat disappears before it reaches your muscles. So for fat, it's 2%. And then for carbs, it's 6 to 8%. That's what they were talking about in the book. So basically, really, it, you know, it's really not about calories in and calories out because they're, they're obviously they're, they're, they're metabolizing differently. And then the same thing really with if somebody who wants to gain weight, uh, that always seems to be the the answer is is protein, more protein, more protein. So talk to us about calories in and calories out and kind of those those two issues. Yeah, so with calorie calories in and calories out, that's a always a controversial topic. And you know, you might read the Atkins Diet Revolution, and they say just you know avoid carbs, and you can eat as much steak and bacon and eggs and cheese, and you'll be fine. Um, well, obviously, uh, I believe it's it's both, right? Um, and, I, and the way that I prove that it's quality calories, not just calories in and calories out, is if you took you know, 100 calories of broccoli and then you took 100 calories of, let's say, uh, Lucky Charms, um, you're going to get a completely different metabolic response. You know, um, with broccoli, obviously, you're getting fiber. You're getting all the phytonutrients. And with Lucky Charms, you're just basically straight lining sugar into your system. So your insulin level is going to go up. Your glucose is really going to be really high. Um, so there, there's a truth to both those factors. Um, I think um, from my perspective, um, I would always try to go with quality of food first. Um, and obviously, if it's you know a physique competitor, uh, bodybuilder, then you have to take in the calorie uh, content um, involved with that. But um, I don't want to have any of my athletes starting to carry around scales in their purses or, you know, counting their, their, their calories in that sense, um, at the beginning, because really, and unless they need to be at four or 5% body fat, they probably don't need to start counting their calories that way. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and it, it's just the problem is people take it to one extreme, you know, they say, Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Just avoid carbs and you'll be fine. And you can eat, you know, 5,000 calories a day. And they go, well, I'm kind of gaining weight <laughs> at this point. Well, you have to take some, you know, a logical point of view and some common sense and say, okay, well, let's cut back on some of the cheese you're eating or some of the other food. So um, I, I think, um, you know, there's some truth, obviously, to the quality calories and, you know, with protein intake and what we we'll refer to as DIT, dietary, dietary induced thermogenesis, uh, which is very true uh, because 
protein um, takes a lot of energy from the body to, to actually break down and utilize it. And so you get that thermogenic, thermogenic effect. Um, I know you had brought um, in the topic about, well, you know, if you want to gain weight, then you got to up your calories. And yeah, that's true. I mean, you need to up your calories to a certain extent. Uh, but again, um, I would go with the quality calories always first. Um, and then if you need to, okay, well, let's, if you're not going anywhere, whether it's losing body fat or um, gaining weight, then let's start uh, manipulating your calorie intake at that point. But I think, you know, that brings in a very um, important point is that you've got to get a baseline. And a lot of people don't have a baseline. Um, so what are, whatever that baseline is, whether it's getting someone on Tanita scales to get their body fat and bioimpedance or doing a nine-site skinful test, you've got to get a baseline when we're talking about body composition. A lot of people don't. Surprisingly, they don't. So um, get a baseline and then start your process. Then you know where to, to go up or down. Uh, with some of these parameters. Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, what about like, and I think it's along the same lines as, as you know, as the calories in, like as long as you're, you know, you're eating clean and you're, you're fine. What about like with fasting and like intermittent fasting and like some people that have recommended, you know, you can have all your calories in this eight hour window. And is there mm-hmm. anything to the nutrient timing? I mean, no, oh, we heard Oh, breakfast is so great. You know, you need breakfast. It's, it's really important. Um, so talk to us about this idea about fasting and, 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 and then uh, I guess it's, it is a different topic, but nutrient timing. And, and because that would be, if you're going to fast and nutrient timing, you're, you're really, you know, you're, you're kind of limited in when you're timing things. Right. I mean, and, and you know, I learned about intermittent fasting. Um, I mean, geez, back in 2010, I think, um, John Berardi were, were lecturing at Perform Better and we had gone to lunch and we're training and he's, I'm like, what are you doing? And he's, you know, what are you doing? And so we were chatting and, and he's, yeah, I'm doing this. And this is like before he came out with this ebook. And so, you know, I'm always experimenting. So I'm like, oh, what the hell? So I'll, I'll, I did the IF and, um, you know, I, I play around with it here and there. Um, I think um, it really depends on the person. And so um, I, I think it's a tool that you can use in your toolbox. Um, I think the problem I see with is everybody saying, oh, you, sh- you should do IF. It's the best way to do it. Uh, I don't think it's the best way to do it for everybody. Um, I think the biggest factor, um, if I'm going to utilize, utilize that with someone, is their lifestyle. So um, if a person's like telling me, Rob, I can't eat six times a day. It's just not going to happen with my schedule. Um, and you know, they have good energy throughout the day. They're not having adrenal fatigue issues, they have, you know, lifestyle factors that are good, then I might put them on that. But in general, for most people, um, you have to have good general um, eating habits. You know, so you, you have to, quote unquote, eat clean. You got you to you gotta know what that is. Whereas if you have someone who's eating a standard American diet and they start that, uh, it could be a disaster waiting to happen. Um, I would say this, it's contraindicated with people that have energy issues. So if they're like, God, I, my energy just really is in the tank. It just sucks. I wouldn't use it with them. They will not know how to regulate their blood sugar um, when they're not having calories in the morning. Um, people with either anxiety or mild forms of depression definitely don't do it. Um, definitely with the athletic population, you have to be very careful. I know there's some people that, that do it and use it and do fairly well. Um, but you have to be very, very careful with it. Um, because, um, one of the biggest things that I see is people not eating enough calories and then actually losing lean body mass. Cause I've done it. <laughs> um, I got, I think all the way down to maybe 168. I mean, at that time for me, it was my goal because I wanted to, I wanted to be lighter as a surfer in the water mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> because there, because there's all these little kids around me that are catching all these waves and I'm not catching the waves cause I can't get into them early enough. So I'm like, okay, screw it. I'm going to drop weight from weight 85. And so I did. The problem is my strength went, you know, through the floor and, um, it was, it was good. It was good to, to learn that. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's definitely something that you can do, but you have to be very careful and, and qualify the person for that particular you know, intermittent fasting plan. Yeah, that that's an interesting point because you do, you're right. You know, you, you try something like that, then now, now your strength is down and so you got to be careful uh, kind of what you wish for, I guess. <laughs> correct, correct. Um, 
Rob, let's just finish up uh, this piece with uh, just some hydration. I think, you know, the blanket recommendation that I first got from you was, uh, which I thought made the most sense because, it, 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 you know, instead of the eight glasses, eight, you know, cups of water a day for everybody, it, you know, took into account body weight. So your recommendation was always, you know, half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 200 pounds, it's 100 ounces. And then uh, 100 ounces of water uh, a day. And then, you know, it, ideally, let's get 25% of that that intake in first thing in the morning. Uh, that's great. But is hydration, is it enough? Because, you know, you also recommend, you know, using Celtic sea salt. I remember you saying if you're using like Fiji water, that had a good, uh, I'm not sure if it was a pH or the magnesium in it, but um, that you and you could tell us. But um, is, is just hydrating enough? Or do we need to think about the Celtic sea salt or is, uh, you know, if we're eating clean, do we even need to worry about that piece of it or just need to get regular hydration in that, that you know, half our body weight in? Yeah, I, I think the half the body weight is a good rule of thumb uh, to start with. But as you mentioned, um, you know, if, if, for example, you know, at, at my house, we have RO, reverse osmosis. Um, the only downside to reverse osmosis as a filtration system is that it does pull a lot of the, the minerals out of the water. And so, you you know, you mentioned uh, Fiji. Fiji has 210 parts per million in terms of what we call the TDS, the total dissolved solids. And so basically that's the mineral content. Um, one of the highest ones is Avion. So it's got, uh, I think it's 3, 309 or something like that. Um, but um, they have a high mineral content. So um, one of the problems that you're going to come across is if you just drink a uh, water that has barely any minerals or electrolytes in it, you're going to drink it and then you're almost going to pee it straight out because you're thinking of it as you're almost diluting the, 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 your, what they call, they say your inner ocean. Cause if you ever taste your blood, it tastes salty. So you have, you know, uh, quite a bit of, uh, electrolytes and salt within your body. And so that's where I do recommend, uh, a small pinch of Celtic sea salt, um, in every liter of water. Um, if it remotely even tastes different or salty, then you put way too much um, salt in there. Um, but you know, uh, one of the main electrolytes in your body is sodium. Um, and so you want the sodium, but then you're getting the other mineral salts, uh, with the Celtic sea salt. So, um, that's why it's so helpful to add that to your water. Um, especially when you're going to be increasing the volume of water. Um, but I, you know, from a research standpoint, I mean, researching this a ton, as well as um, clinically, I mean, it helps a tremendous amount uh, for a number of different factors. Um, and we were, we're talking about, you know, trainers, coaches, strength coaches, um, from joints perspective. Um, you know, I've had people come up to me, I didn't even know who they were, and say, hey, Rob, you know, thanks so much for your, you know, podcast you did on so-and-so. And, -so and you know, I just increased my water take within a week. I noticed my joints felt better. Um, I mean, you just look at, you know, an intravertebral disc in your lumbar spine and your cervical spine. Uh, the, you know, the, you, everybody knows the center is this, the nucleus propulsus. That's primarily composed of water. So when you turn in for the night, you wake up in the morning, you get inhibition and you should wake up a centimeter and a half taller because the discs have rehydrated. But that only happens if, that only happens if you're hydrated. So, you know, it's very, uh, a good method or, uh, prof being prophylactic for low back pain for a lot of your low back pain people. So, um, you know, it, I can't recommend it enough. I mean, I've seen so many benefits to it. Um, and of course, I don't know, three months, people will probably say, stop drinking water. It's bad for you. <laughs> um, but, um, really, uh, it, it's a good foundation to do that. You know, half your body ounces for the day, uh, 25% take first thing in the morning because when you wake up in the morning, you haven't consumed any water. So, um, that really helps start the process and it gets you to get the water into the system earlier because when people start drinking water too late, I think that's one of the main, um, disruptions of why people wake up and have to go to the bathroom. Okay. Nice. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I've noticed, and people always give me a hard time because I drink the Fiji water. Like, I have Poland Spring for my clients. Like, I actually, they get a Poland Spring, like a 16-ounce. Right. They're like, wait, you're drinking Fiji. I'm like, well, you know. So, but, um, 
But I do notice when I do run out of the Fiji and I put the Celtic uh, sea salt in the Poland Spring, I drink it so much faster. I, I'm, I don't know if it's just in my yeah. head or it just goes down a lot easier and a lot quicker. Um, yeah. And the same thing with the Fiji. I just, I, I, first of all, I feel like I taste the Fiji. I taste the difference. People tell me I'm crazy, but I, I do. I yeah. feel like I taste the difference. And same thing with the, uh, when I, when I put the pinch in, I really feel like I drink it faster. Why, why am I feeling like I'm drinking that faster? Or is it going down easier? Yeah, no, uh, that's one of the comments that I received from a lot of my athletes is that, oh, it's just easier to drink the water when I get that salt in there. Um, you know, pe- people will think, you know, we're crazy because, you know, like you're a fan of Fiji. Um, my wife sometimes gets pissed at me because I'm just like, I'm an Avion snob, right? Um, <laughs> and so my oldest son um, loves Avion. So every time if we buy a bottle of water because we're going on a surf trip or something, I mean, literally, like we, I just went on a surf trip just a couple weeks ago. And, um, I mean, he literally hoards the water underneath his bed. I mean, he's 13 years old, but he's, you know, he's hoarding the avion. I'm like, Caleb, come here. Where's the water? And he just kind of puts his head down, just brings back the water. Um, but it, there, I think what it is is that um, for people that don't, they don't drink juice, they don't drink soda, they don't drink all the other, you know, sorts of drinks, maybe have coffee or, you know, that sort of drink, um, you can really taste the difference in the water. Um, and it just makes sense because if you're so used to just drinking soda or you're drinking Gatorade and juice with all these other things in the water, when you take, when you drink water, obviously you're going to say there's no taste Yeah. because your perspective went from something that's super sweet, that has sugar and salt in it to something that doesn't have it. So you're like, well, this tastes like crap. But one of the interesting things, um, that I've, found is that if someone says, oh, water doesn't taste like anything and, you know, I need something with taste, right? Or I need something with bubbles, right? They need something with, you know, soda or carbonation. That's a classic sign clinically that they're dehydrated. So when they say, oh, I need something sweet or I need something with bubbles, that's a sign that they're dehydrated. They have, they're not drinking enough um, water during the day. And so surprising what happens is that once they get to pretty close to that half their body weight of the water, they go, wow, I don't really feel like I need anything with bubbles in it or something sweet or anything yeah. like that. So it's, um, it's actually a quite interesting change to see that um, in, in people, even people that are addicted to you know, things like Diet Coke. Yeah, yeah, awesome, interesting. Uh, all right, well, this has been amazing. It's always great to kind of get all these different recommendations, and now I'm going to probably – uh, head out to vitamin shop right now. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that's right, Robert. Before we uh, go, I just want to say uh, you can find all the information on robertyang.net. Robert Yang, Y A N G dot net. Um, and uh, you have a book coming out. When, when is the book coming out? When's it, like, and what's going to be the name of it? If you know, I know him. that's that's always a question, and oh, that, and okay. that's you know, the, it's the the title's working process right now. Um, it's being edited as we speak. So. Um, you know, hopefully maybe we'll do something in, you know, six months or something and, um, you know, we'll have the name of the book and everything will be established by then. But, um, yeah, um, that's a work in progress right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Let's get you on, uh, when that book's coming out. So, uh, good stuff. Thanks so much for coming on today and spending so much time with us talking about some topics that, uh, are, uh, some hot buttons for, uh, for a lot of people. And I think it's just one of those topics that you, know, you can kind of keep hearing over and over again. And then sometimes certain things don't stick. So, uh, great stuff, Robert. Oh, thanks Anthony for having me on. Appreciate it. All right, well, that's going to do for episode 192 of the Shrink Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Poyer, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performmetal.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Robert Yang for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning, nutrition, and performance enhancement. Rachel Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Alistair McCall and the McCall Method. Check him out at mccallmethod.com. Diane Vivas and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. And of course, remember you can join strengthcoach.com. Have access to the site for just a dollar. It's a three day trial, three days, just a buck to access that offer. Go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name's Anthony Renna, and you can reach me at strengthcoachpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.